Do you want to find out what the experts in distilled spirits businesses have to say about managing and operating a distillery? Well, you should check out the Distilled Spirits Business Certificate from the University of Louisville. It's a six-course online program taught in part by real corporate fellows, meaning that you're getting real experience from the experts at the most renowned distilleries, companies, and startups in the industry. We're talking leaders from Brown Foreman, Jack Daniels, and so many more. Get enrolled right now to this fully online program at uofl.me slash bourbon pursuit. Are you looking for great gift ideas this holiday season? Then you need to check out Penelope Bourbon's award-winning four grain and barrel strength expressions. Bottled at the historic Castle and Key Distillery, Penelope's balanced flavor profile is the perfect palate pleaser this holiday season. Order both expressions today on sealbox.com and receive free shipping using promo code Penelope Pursuit. That's Penelope Pursuit on sealbox.com and give the perfect gift this year. Are you looking for an app to track your tasting notes and bottles, but also connect with other bourbon drinkers? The Oak Bottle Tasting app uses powerful analytics to suggest new spirits for you based on your reviews and the tasting notes that you enjoy. Explore the feed to like and comment on the tastings of your friends, distilleries, and verified tasters. With over 250 different tasting notes, recording your own tastings has never been easier or more accurate. Join the fastest growing community of tasters today. Search for Oak Bottle app on the Apple App Store. So you're having a 4th of July get together. You know, Stephen gave me a bottle and I'm coming over, you know, to, to pour it for someone. My kid bumps me or something happens and the thing drops and it splatters all over the concrete. By the way, your bottles are not concrete proof. <laughs> Don't know like you, know. you just need to get a new kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> This is episode 281 of Bourbon Pursuit, the podcast featuring news, reviews, and interviews with people making the bourbon whiskey industry happen. Before we start talking to Stephen Bean today, here's your weekly bourbon news update. So how are you going to be celebrating Repeal Day this year? Join myself, Fred Minnick, Blake, Breaking Bourbon, Brian Hara, musical artists like Lindsay L., Sean James, and many others in a virtual Repeal Day Expo. It's a full day of bourbon-inspired presentations and private concerts. You can get your tickets for the December 5th event at repealdayexpo.com. We're super excited to be a part of the new Aged and Ore Spirits Flight launch that is now happening on Kickstarter. If you haven't seen it yet, it's a set of four glasses, each etched with letters A through D, and they also have multi-function rubber stops. And the rubber stops are also coded A through D that you hang on your whiskey bottle that you can do for blind tastings. And they also secure the glasses in place to the flight tray so you can hang it right on the wall. It's the best new tool that you didn't know that you actually need. Check it out at bourbonpursuit.com flight. Four Roses is announcing plans for an expansion of its current visitor center and enhancements to the overall guest experience at the Bourbon Distillery located in Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. In 1910, the Louisville-based architecture firm Joseph & Joseph designed the distillery in a Spanish mission style that is unique to Four Roses and is on the National Register of Historic Places. Today, that firm is now Joseph & Joseph and Bravura and is designing the distillery's latest expansion in that same style. There will be a new 3,800 square foot outdoor covered patio and cocktail area. The expansion will allow Four Roses to potentially double the visitor capacity and is expected to be completed at the end of 2021. In other big news, Stag Jr. is joining the Single Barrel Select program in 2021 at Buffalo Trace. This is something that many bourbon lovers out there have been you know, ready to rejoice, but to be honest, it's still going to be very hard to come by. But the very first barrel has been donated to St. Jude for their online auction. Along with the Stag Jr. barrel, the winner gets a VIP Buffalo Trace experience, which includes a stay at the Stag Lodge that has a panoramic view of Buffalo Trace, and you can view and bid on this item at vfundraise.com slash gifts 2020. Now moving on to bourbon release news. Blackened Whiskey, which you may know is a collaboration between the late Dave Pickerel, who was on the podcast back on episode 142, and heavy metal rock sensation Metallica. They have a new exclusive cask strength release. And this limited edition release is a blend of straight whiskeys finished in black brandy casks and went through their proprietary sonic enhancement process called Black Noise. 
where it low hertz frequencies from Metallica and the San Francisco Symphony's SNM2 playlist were used to extract more of those black brandy characteristics. It's bottled at 110.7 proof, with only 1,100 bottles available at Kroger locations across Kentucky, with a retail price of $54.99. New Rift Distilling is announcing a new bourbon called Winter Whiskey. It's distilled with malted oat and chocolate malt to resemble a chocolate oatmeal stout. The mash bill includes 65% corn, 20% malted oats, 7% pale ale malt, and 5% steel cut raw oats, and 3% chocolate malt. It's a lot of grains there. Winter whiskey is bottled in bond without chill filtration, aged at least four years, and bottled at 100 proof with an SRP of $49.99. Kentucky Owl has announced a pair of limited edition releases, which is Kentucky Owl Rye Batch Number 4 and Kentucky Owl Bourbon Batch Number 10. It'll be slated for availability around the holiday season. Batch 4 is dubbed The Last Rye. Not really sure what that means. Who knows if it is the last or not, but it is bottled at 112.8 proof and is a blend of 10 through 13-year-old rye stocks. Kentucky Owl Bourbon Batch Number 10 was bottled at 120.2 proof and will be available at select spirits retailers nationwide and each of them are priced with a suggested retail price of $299.99. Thank you to everyone who has supported our Private Label Pursuit series. We just sold out of episode 32, which was our second to last 15-year-old Tennessee bourbon barrel. We have one more that we're saving until it turns 16, and after that, we're done with that train. And after December, we're moving on, and we are launching Pursuit United, so stay tuned for more details at PursuitSpirits.com, and of course, Pursuit Spirits on all the socials as well. Now, you may never heard of Limestone Branch before, and maybe you're just now starting to hear about Yellowstone Bourbon. Stephen Beam, yep, there's a lot of beams in the bourbon industry around Kentucky, is a descendant of the Dant family. Yes, that JW Dant that you're thinking of right now. This one is full of rich history on the family as well as the labels. So what are you in the mood for? Bourbon, rye, rum, maybe just a special finished whiskey. You can get all of these from Barrel Bourbon and you can order online as well at BarrelBourbon.com. With that, enjoy today's episode and here's Fred Minnick with Above the Char. I'm Fred Minnick and this is Above the Char. As we come up on the holidays, I think it's important to note what gifts I really hate getting that are whiskey related. Now listen, I never look a gift horse in the mouth and I think it's always kind that one of my relatives thinks that buying me something whiskey related is a good gift. It is a good gift. But there are some gifts that I just like, oh, another set of whiskey stones. I hate these things. I've always hated these things. Why don't people read my tweets? <laughs> <laughs> or an ice ball. I used to actually really dig the ice balls. Now, like, I get an ice ball and it, like, cracks and I don't like ripping it apart. I'm just, I'm always at the point now where I'm like, yeah, these ice balls are a pain in the ass. I'm not going to deal with them anymore. Now, I do, I do like the ice makers. If you want to buy me one of those, those are really badass. I love the ice makers that come with clear ice. Oh, those are so cool. Uh, let's see, what else? Or what are some other things? I, I can't tell you how many people have gone to garage sales or have gone to uh, like flea market sales and seen like uh, a bottle, um, a Jim Beam decanter from the 70s. They get it and they're all excited. And I'm like, yay, I got a Jim Beam decanter. I, I might be one of the only people who don't like Jim Beam decanters from the 70s. They just kind of... They always smell like an old man's basement and his toilet, you know, got broke and it flooded one year and the bottles were kind of caught up in the flood of toilet water kind of smell. I'm kind of, I'm looking at them right now. So I'm actually having this weird vision of, of this toilet water running over them. Anyway, I'm made to see some therapy. I have some major issues about this stuff, but. I know everyone's got, everyone's got one of those gifts that they are like, oh no, please don't give me that. Oh, you know, so tell me, tell us on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, however it is you, you know, you do your communicating. Tell us the whiskey gift that you hate getting. Tag Bourbon Pursuit and Fred Minnick. The best one that Kenny and I deem to be the best 
will get a big box of nothing, and we can guarantee you that you're not going to get it, so it'll be the best non-prize you've ever gotten. And that's this week's Above the Char. Hey, that was kind of a crappy Above the Char on my part because people like to give gifts. We should always be thankful for gifts, and I'm thankful for you all for always listening to this podcast. Until next week, cheers! Welcome back to the episode of Bourbon Pursuit, the official podcast of bourbon. Fred and Kenny here today talking with somebody that Fred's known for a very long time. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to know more about his story because he's got a name that resonates with every bourbon lover out there, and that is the word beam. Yeah, so, and it's a shame that Ryan's not here because we could have talked that. We could have had half an episode about landscaping too. <laughs> <laughs> but um, uh, yeah, Stephen Beam is uh, a descendant of the Dan family and of course the Beam family. He's, um, uh, you know, everybody everybody sees these whiskey brands and the, and the history and the heritage behind them. And we have a living, breathing, breathing member of like, you know, two dominant uh, families in American whiskey. But um, what I see is that, you know, Steve's always been a friend. He's a good man. Um, and he's been a part of something that, um, you know, I've been slightly a part of, and that's br bringing, you know, MBA to, to Louisville. So there's a lot of things that Steve does that kind of goes outside of whiskey. And I think a lot of it's because he's just a good human being. Yeah. yeah just a great dude. And when, before we started recording, I was talking about that. I actually came to the distillery uh, before this podcast was ever a thing. Uh, we were talking about because I remember being there and the only thing available was the, the moonshine. And mm -hmm. so we kind of talked about that. And I think it'll be really cool to understand exactly, you know, the journey, you know, the path that he's carved and how Limestone Branch is starting to, you know, start coming out with new products and everything like that and trying to, you know, really put themselves on the map. So it's going to be And oh, by the way, he was uh, the front and center of the series Moonshiners. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, so we have that yeah. in common too. I've been on Moonshiners a couple of times oh, okay. now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Got some got some old old TV stars over here. <laughs> yeah, some IMDb pages about to start blowing up here soon. Yeah. And Turtle Man. That's I've been on. Oh, you been a Turtle, Turtle Man? Man. <laughs> oh, for anybody that doesn't know, like you go Google Turtle Man and you'll you'll see exactly what it's all. Can you do the Turtle Man yell? No, <laughs> I don't know a Turtle Man. I have to go check that out. Oh, oh you dude. need to check it out. Oh man, he's he's this guy and he goes and he actually like hunts and not hunts, but he like pulls out snapping turtles out of the ground and he's just got this. Yeah, 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 like this yell that he does every, every single time he pulls one out. Oh, he's he's a Kentucky legend, man. I'm surprised. Yeah. Wow. I think he's yeah. originally from like Somerset or something like yeah. that. Yeah, he lives he lives in Lebanon. Now. Is that where it is? Yeah. Okay, but uh, yeah. By the so. way, snapping turtles those are like the most frightening creatures. <laughs> Talk about lose a finger. Uh, that's not what I'm thinking about when they're going to snap. <laughs> Yeah, I guess don't swim in those waters. Yeah, <laughs> especially nude. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go to introduce our guest today. So today on the show, we have Stephen Beam. He is the president and distiller at Limestone Branch Distillery in Lebanon, Kentucky. So Stephen, welcome to the show. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be here. You know, it's just nice to get out and change the walls. Oh, for sure. And, and see new people. And see new people. So Fred's old, but yeah. Fred's yeah. old. Yeah. I'm old and crusty. <laughs> I'm somewhat new, I guess. You know, Kenny doesn't have any gray hair. You oh, know? I got that. That's good on the side. It's coming on the sides. It's yeah, boy. But it's 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 not it's not salt and pepper enough. It's just yeah. I'm I'm like I'm becoming more salt by the day. <laughs> you look distinguished though. Yeah, I guess whatever. People might start taking you more seriously. <laughs> I it, doubt it. Maybe that's what it's. <laughs> it, it's funny. I was in uh, in a photo and I was trying to find myself and I, I was like I couldn't find myself and then I realized that I was the one with all the white hair because <laughs> I was from the back and I was like. Oh my God! When did this happen? <laughs> that was uh, we were out doing a, a, a service project in Yellowstone, and uh, they had taken a picture and shared it. And so I'm like, well, I'm not even on in that photo. <laughs> so like, oh, I'm oh, the old wait, guy with there, the white hair. There it is. There's me. <laughs> so before we kind of dive into you know you and the history and more about Yellowstone, we always kind of start these off with kind of like a fun question. And so yours today is: Do you believe in aliens? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Like, uh, have you seen one? Think you experienced one, or think it's all like government conspiracy oh, hype? You know, now, now I'm going to tell him my brother. Okay. <laughs> and he would hate me to t say this, but uh, my brother uh, worked at Ford, uh, and he was coming home one night, and uh, he said that you know he's something came over, hovered over his uh, car, and then just disappeared. disappeared in the night like that. 
And uh, if you know my brother, he's not one. At first, he wouldn't be drinking it <laughs> and driving, and uh, and he is a straight shooter. So I, I, when, when he, I've always had my questions. You know, just when you think about it, I mean, the the world is so. I mean, the universe is so so large. I mean, yeah, and and we'd be. It's pretty arrogant to think that we would be the only ones here. Now, whether they've actually made contact, that's a whole other story. Mm-hmm. What about you, Fred? Are you uh, you believer in UFOs? Ah, I'm going to have nightmares tonight. <laughs> but uh, so uh, when I was a kid, I used to watch Unsolved Mysteries. And when they did the alien episodes, I couldn't sleep. You know, <laughs> I was so scared. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I don't think I don't think you mm. can live today w- without acknowledging that there's aliens. Um, be, you know, first of all, the NASA is starting to release uh, boatloads of information of un- unidentified objects, you know, flying. You know, there's a lot of theories as to what those could be. Um, you know, but I, I really, I really think that if you know the aliens are looking at us, thinking, "What the fuck is wrong with these people?" <laughs> you know, I mean, geez, I mean, you, you, you can't even get along over a taco or or a cheeseburger. <laughs> like you argue over everything, right. and like you. You know, one person likes that bourbon and that person doesn't. And so you get in fights on Facebook about the bourbon. <laughs> oh, the, so, bourbon, the bourbon Facebook fights. <laughs> yeah. I mean, could you imagine being stops. an alien race observing us through bourbon Facebook groups? Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> like, they're doing what? A potato? <laughs> <laughs> What's a tater? <laughs> but yeah, I... Uh, that's the, certainly not the kind of question you normally ask. Is there, are, are you, is there something you need to tell us, Kenny? Uh, no, I mean, this was just something that, you know, I, I thought of, I was like, cause there's some people that they believe, maybe they don't believe. I don't know. I, I, I feel that there is this, I totally agree with both of you. Like the universe is massive. Like mm-hmm. it, it is, it'd be arrogant to think that we're the only species or anything like that. However, I do feel a little weird that they haven't had at least some sort of contact or some sort of well, proof or something like that you know i, I want to feel like it's uh you know like i forget movie it had like jody foster and they i think it was actually called contact yeah I mean, and yeah. yeah and so it, you would think that there'd be something there that it, in most of these that either we we hear about or we you know put in movies their you know their technology or whatever it is is so far beyond of what we have and now you're like oh God, maybe we're not so advanced after all well, and I think that's that's where a lot of people always go. But what if we are like actually really advanced, but we just lack, you know, the space travel uh, capabilities? And I think like Star Trek has a really good philosophy is you don't make first contact unless you have warp warp drive capabilities, which <laughs> you can get the hell out of there, <laughs> you know, can move. So um, I, I think that um, the X-Files also had a really good theory as to why a- aliens first came here. It was because after the atomic bomb dropped, like it's in, it's it's basically disrupted space because there was put so much pressure and everything out there, and they saw that the the nuclear weapon capabilities and it and it had a had the potential to change the the universe, and so naturally in X Files humans captured the aliens and then started carving it up and using its DNA <laughs> in the in people and so forth. So you know, just hopefully I, you don't have to live through like an Independence Day kind of thing. Yeah. You know. I mean, if we're going to war with the aliens, I mean, I got a 45 Colt that I know I can survive probably at least two of them. Um, <laughs> oh, they, get, they got lasers or something. They probably you know, I, lasers don't scare me. Yeah. It's them eating me. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Oh. I'm more afraid of like <laughs> they the want to dissect and, you and what have you, but yeah. they want to see what's up with your bourbon collection. Well, you know, you never know with the, with the year that we've had and what's going on, you know. Oh, aliens are up. definitely on the yeah. list. It's on the, it's on the bingo card. <laughs> and if it's not, if it, it, it's definitely everyone brings it up, but you know, then people just dismiss it and be like, oh, you know, that's wacky talk. But I mean, I think more and more, and the conversation about aliens is no longer going to get you in the psych ward. You know, now it's <laughs> like. I mean, here we, we're on a bourbon podcast. We're having a serious discussion about aliens and we're laughing a little bit, but both, all of us are like, hmm, mm. yeah, what, what, what would I do? Where, where am I going? There, I think that's- There is I, some truth to this. Yeah, I mean, so- Hopefully there is a men in black like society out there that is protecting us. Maybe we just don't know. Yeah, yeah, I just don't. I really, listen, aliens, you go do alien stuff. Just leave us alone. And for God's sake, stay away from my bourbon. Yeah, we can, all, we can all agree with that. 
So let's go ahead. We'll uh, we'll kind of dive into whiskey. I think that's people what they really care about anyway. So, Stephen, let's kind of start with you and and let's. I think since yeah, I mean you have the name, you've got the lineage. Let's start at your childhood. <laughs> sit sit back on the chair and start telling us everything. No, but I mean, uh, kind of kind of give us an idea of like what it was like growing up, uh, knowing that you were associated with um, you know the beams and bourbon and everything like that growing up. Kind of talk about. Well, it's kind of, it's kind of funny because my father always downplayed it and uh, said, "Oh, well, they're distant. You know, we're we're not we're, not, we're not those beans." Yeah, and my dad always said they're bonded and we were blended. But <laughs> <laughs> that's a good. I, I like that. I like that. But uh, but I grew. I tell people I grew up around it. You know, I had all, m- many many cousins who were in the business, uh, uncles who were in uncles who were in the business. Uh, So I grew up with everyone in and around it, not necessarily in our family. My father worked briefly in it, in the business in the forties and then left, which he actually played baseball. And that's a whole nother story. What was your father's name? Uh, Jim. Jim. There we go. (laughs) Okay. So we we want to make sure that we we are establishing the, how serious this is. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but I, I will put it with my mom because she was very, very proud of the fact that she was uh, a Dant of Dant heritage and lineage, and um, so J W Dant, and she took us around and sh- and showed us where the old distilleries were, and talked about the old. Uh, my like my grandmother grew up around the distillery, the house at the distiller's house there, and so we have a lot of stories like that. And so my mom really pushed the fact that that we were there, and I really didn't find out about. Uh, like minor case and and our ties to the bourbon industry until I was uh, probably in high school. We'll kind of talk about that then. How do you how do you find out about it? it was just a uh, sitting around at Christmas and then somebody says like, oh, by the way. Well, you know, it was it's kind of funny because I was I was always interested in getting into the business, although I didn't want to uh, necessarily work on a line somewhere, you know, and that was kind of where things were in the seventies. Uh, so. Um, I looked in, was looking into it, and I, I actually looked into what it would be like to get into the distilling business. I, I looked at UK to see mm-hmm. if there was any kind of program, no, nothing on distilling. Yeah. And uh, this my, was in the 70s? Yeah. Yeah. And my dad was like, oh, well, you'll need to be a chemi- chemical engineer. And I'm like, well, that leaves that out. <laughs> <laughs> Anything with the word engineer it sounds like that. It sounds like a lot of math and science. Yeah, this the, be tough. Yeah, actually, the engineer part's okay, the chemical part chemistry and I didn't get along. Yeah. So. <laughs> but um, yeah, so I just, just started doing research on the family and uh, started finding out more and more about, you know, how significant our family did play in, in, in the bourbon industry. So but you didn't have to look far because there's a lot of materials on uh, definitely beans, but I mean, you know, pre 2000s, you know, I feel like the Dan family does it, like it almost like in the modern era of whiskey, it like almost gets no credit. And of course, Heaven Hill basically just has a bottled and bond. It's like if you know, if you know your whiskey, you get it. But and outside and of people look at it and it's usually bottom shelf. Exactly. I mean, right. it gets like that name Dant. Uh, I mean, it was beam Dant, neck and neck all, right. you know, throughout the early 1900s right and actually after uh prohibition the dance were much more formidable than the beams yeah ab- absolutely correct yeah. absolutely correct because they actually had money the beams had no money <laughs> yeah and, and it, it, i remember uh reading a lot of um uh, materials from 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 the dance in that in that time frame and some of the i mean they were strong business people strong yeah well, kind of talk let's educate some of our listeners maybe myself too so you know, you had mentioned that the, the Dant family had money. Kind of talk about the history of the Dant's, the, the, you know, everything that they had built and, and sort of what that culminated to. Okay. So J.W. Dant uh, was born in Kentucky and he started distilling in 1836. And uh, he did this, one of the early adopters of the sour mash process. And when he first started, he didn't have a whole lot of money and they, he distilled on the log, uh, which meant that they took a log and in his case it was a poplar log and they hollowed out the center and then uh would pipe steam into it and they would actually cook their mash in that log then ferment it and then uh put a cap on it and distill off of it as well it's like a one-stop shop for 
a- absolutely. Distillation. And okay. you can imagine it was pr- uh, probably fairly rough, uh, but that was typical of the of the era. And uh, from what I understand, he had a 15 gallon copper finish still, and he finished all of his in that. And so he became well known for having a really high quality sour mash whiskey and uh, became very successful and had four, 14 children and seven sons, uh, all be, in the state in the business. So Oof, busy man. Yeah. Well, you know, that's what you did back then. Like <laughs> you, you needed help on the farm, make another kid. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, you know, some of them, they, you know, they get married and go. So you still have to, you know, fill in the exactly, ranks. Exactly. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's, it's funny because. When we opened the distillery, we had uh, a gentleman that came in, and he was my age, and he said he was uh, J.W. Dance's uh, great-grandson. And I was like, me too? Yeah, <laughs> no, I'm his great-great, so it was okay. a generation. So he was my grandmother's generation. And I was like, you mean great-great, right? And he said, no, no, I'm, I'm his great-grandson. And it was the youngest, my, uh, my great-great-grandfather was toward the beginning he was one of the older ones and then his mother was the youngest of all those children uh, his grandmother and then his mother was the youngest of that family and then he was the so was the youngest 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 but he was it was just so funny to see someone my grandmother would have been a hundred years old and he was probably in his 50s but they were of the same same generation wow Wow. you know it's funny because the beams had very similar breeding <laughs> techniques because you, know, you look at their family tree there's like 30 over here 15 there i mean it's you come right. from a long line of breeders Steve. yeah well catholics you know like, <laughs> <laughs> but you know the beams weren't catholic but they married catholics so yeah you know that's that happens <laughs> uh, and so the other part of that this you know I, I would say when you talk to that gentleman that came in you just like look at a chart be like so are you my like uncle like four times removed <laughs> like how like how did you figure out like, well, i always ask you know, what, well which which one were you because i i, I kn- kind of know them and uh so it's easy to kind of place sort of it, I, nothing's easy because they're all in there especially my family tree because it intertwines because of uh my grandmother's sister married into the Dant family. So, mm-hmm. the, you know, they, two, two sides of the family through marriage intertwined into the dance. So it was, uh, it was very confusing when I was young. So still, it still gets confusing. But. Yeah. I, I can, I can, I'm already confused. <laughs> so I want to continue a little bit on the, the Dant history here. So, so Dant had a 15 gallon still 14 kids. Where does it go from here and how do they, how do they build so, an empire, if you will? So he became, uh, successful. Uh, one of the stories I I love is that when the market got saturated here in uh, Kentucky, he uh, had a raft built and they took it to New Orleans. So they would go down the Pottinger's Creek to the Salt River, to the Ohio River, to the Mississippi, and then on to New Orleans. And he went down and sold his whiskey and uh, walked back and they'd walk back the Natchez Trace, uh, which was, you know, today we go... No, he didn't. He, nobody would walk from you know New Orleans to Kentucky, but it was rather common, you know, back then. Holy smokes! Yeah, yeah. I couldn't. I couldn't do that. Walk. And uh, so, and then the next year he went down, and uh, they said he made enough money that he bought a mule and rode back. And so I guess he became. Uh, that was the beginning of him becoming prosperous. <laughs> so, so, uh, but he he built a, a, a very large following and a, a good distillery. Uh, it was interesting. His, his distillery was all gravity fed. Uh, the distillery that he built into a hillside, which was kind of an engineering uh, feat at that time as well. And then uh, his oldest son, Bernard Dant, started a Cold Spring distillery, which would eventually become Yellowstone. Oh, okay. There we go. So, so the Dant family legacy. So it it basically it, you know you're trucking stuff down in New Orleans, trying to sell it, and and from there it just grows and grows and grows, right. and then. Was this, where, where was the kind of tipping point or where like Dant saw like a, a decline? I mean, is this, is this a prohibition story or is this something well, before? Actually, them? prohibition, they, they did well in prohibition because they held on to the whiskey stocks and they uh, licensed the brands through, uh, at least Yellowstone, through uh, Brown Foreman. So Brown Foreman uh, bottled and sold Yellowstone during prohibition. 
And then after Prohibition, they built a massive distillery down in here in uh, Louisville off South 7th Street. I think it was the tallest column still at the, in the, the state at the time. Uh, and yeah, so they did very well. And Yellowstone was a popular brand. I always heard it was a very popular brand with, moon, uh, with uh, bootleggers. Uh, so Why is that? It was a, a good quality and reasonably priced. Oh, well, then yeah. I guess that will work. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I've had some of that uh, vintage uh, Yellowstone. It's tasty. Yeah. Real tasty. Because you're a bootlegger, uh, too. <clears throat> Kenny. <laughs> Bro, come on, man. I'm sorry. We, yeah. we don't talk about We're that always side recording. of the business. Always recording. Sorry. And also, it's got pretty good brand recognition. I think we all know about Yellowstone, the yeah. park. In, yeah, absolutely with the park. So, And, and uh, the name came from the founding of the park in 1872. When the park was founded, um, they had a salesman. His name was Charles Townsend, and he he came back from out west. And the, everybody was so excited about this new first national park that uh, he convinced them to name a bourbon Yellowstone. So they branded the bourbon Yellowstone, and and it's been on the shelf ever since. Like I said, that was uh, pre uh, trademark litigation uh, <laughs> in a big way because you know, could get away with that today. Yeah, you know. Yeah, well, there, there, yeah, there, there are some like Yellowstone beers and things when you go out toward yeah. Montana, but uh, yeah, it is. We we're grandfathered in, so uh, been around a long time. Now this is a this is a huge sidebar. And Kenny's not going to like it, but do you watch the Yellowstone show? I do. Isn't that good? It is. Who it, says I wouldn't like this? I don't know. I just because <laughs> you, you never like it when we go off too much off topic. Yeah. So I, I do. It's uh, I tell people it's you know it's like the the twenty twenty version of Dallas. You know. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's it, it's so good. But I'm I'm always watching it. I'm like, why is bullet? Well, I know why bullets in every dadgum show. It's because they're paying for it. But I was like, why in the hell don't they have like a collab with you guys? Probably just need that. <laughs> They need it. And for those not uh, listening, <laughs> Steve made the money sign, so they want a fat check. Yeah. But yeah. we do we do actually advertise on, on Yellowstone. It's been very well. Oh. Uh, yeah. It's, it's done very well for us. It was, at the, at it the was recent too, right? No, we, the, we oh. Yellowstone on, on the show. Oh. Yeah. I remember, yeah, I remember nice. seeing something like that uh, recently. Yeah. Think, think Yellow, he, Yellowstone yeah, for all. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I remember seeing it. So, so I actually don't watch it on the, on the live version. So yeah. I, I try to skip the commercials. Apologize. <laughs> right. so. No, that's okay. But it's done. But it's, you already got me. It's so done, you, done well. my business. You know, when you write those big checks for commercials like that, you always wonder if it's actually going to make a difference. But that, that was instantaneously. You could, you could tell. So. They say that too about the Bourbon Pursuit sponsors. They say they, <laughs> they can't keep it in stock. You know? I know. It just it keeps flying <laughs> off the shelf. God, it's the, the BP effect. <laughs> <laughs> so, Steve, I, I, I know I'm going to keep harping you on history here. I think because I think it's so much fun to talk about. Um, so we had we had mentioned and talked about the dance, but there's there, there is a there is a point that maybe I don't even know about, and, and that's when did when did dance kind of like have this like falling off where. <laughs> It then became, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, it's a it's now kind of like a lower tier, bottom shelf, plastic handle thing coming from Heaven Hill. Right. Well, uh, Yellowstone was sold in the early 40s to Glenmore. And then uh, the Thompson family had it up until the 90s. Yep. And then um, J.W. Dan, that was sold out of the family in the 1950s. But it, there was a lot of maybe family infighting and things with people, you know, it, it, there was a lot of, of issues there <laughs> with lines of uh, descent, maybe. Yeah, yeah well, like it, who yeah, controls what? Who controlled what? Yeah. Uh, uh, with fourteen kids and counting, that yeah. I'm sure that gets yeah. a little little hairy. So, but in, anyway, so it, the the last of the George Dant owned uh, J W Dant brand. He sold that actually to Armand Hammer. And I think that was in the fifties. Really, I didn't know that. Yeah, Armand Hammer said that that was his. Uh, the best investment he ever made because he turned around. Uh, yeah, I think he bought it for two or three million, something like that, and and turned around and sold it to Shinley, I think, or you know, Shinley, I think. But anyway, yeah. for like sixteen million, like just a couple of years later, and it had to do with something. You may know this, Fred. Had something to do with uh, production and the war and allotments and things. I, I don't. I don't know. Yeah, so in 42, like, there was, uh, you know, they started making people distill industrial alcohol or not do anything at all. And uh, it was just a great diversification around 
the really the everybody in business at that time was trying to diversify and you saw people getting into briefcases <laughs> and penicillin and and uh is is weird <laughs> we need yeah. to probably diversify in the penicillin pursuit uh you know penicillin <laughs> is is uh is losing its mojo it's not as hot as it used to be so. go figure <laughs> go figure uh so that's awesome I mean, at least we kind of know exactly how the how that sort of happened and then kind of talk about let's let's focus on you a little bit so you know you had mentioned that you know high school era you kind of looked at the distilling business and, and bourbon business and said like this looks like fun but i don't want to go work on a line right where did you find that passion to start driving and say okay well i actually want to start getting into the business now well all through i, I went on to school but i've i've had always been interested in uh, horticulture. I had a greenhouse when I was like ten years old. So now, uh, were you? Gr- what were you growing in that greenhouse <laughs> at ten years old in Kentucky? I I was growing succulents actually. Okay, <laughs> but I I, know, I had friends who were growing, uh, you know, some other things. Mm. But <laughs> <laughs> the other hand, <laughs> the other Steve Beam was yeah. growing. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so anyway, so I, I went ahead with uh, that as my career with in landscape architecture but through college is really when i really started doing a lot more research on the family both the dance and the beams and uh really became interested in it and uh i just started to look at the possibility of opening a distillery but at that time you still had to have a uh gauger on site Mm -hmm. it was not geared toward small scale production Everything was geared toward, you know, the massive distilleries. So, and you said this is about college time frame you were looking. Yeah, at? Okay. when I graduated from college uh, is when I really started looking into it, and then so I just shelved it and uh, thought, well, you know, this is maybe something that I, I would do down the road sometime. So I kept doing what I was doing, and then eventually this thing called the internet started to appear uh, back in the old dial-up days, and mm. you know, I do some searches and. And got a few little hits and things. And uh, I think the first one, I, a small distillery I found out about was uh, Fritz Maytag out in Anchor and Dry Fly in uh, Washington State. And so that kind of got me back interested into thinking that, well, this might be a possibility down the road. It's interesting you mentioned those two because usually someone mentions like uh, Hudson um, or they'll mention... Um, you know, Garrison Brothers or somebody like that about sparking their interest. You don't really hear people mention uh, Maytag or uh, Trifly. That's cool. That goes way back. Those are yeah, the, those <laughs> those are the craft distiller OGs. You <laughs> yeah. Know? yeah. So, and then it's funny because American Distilling Institute had a uh, conference here. Mm-hmm. Uh, they used to have it here every other year or that so. Was, are we talking 2008? Uh, yes. Yeah. 2008. Were you in the business then? Yeah. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. That was back when bourbon was just a, you know. I think tw- that might be where we met. Possibly. Uh, was it the Brown Hotel? Yeah. Yeah. So it's. Uh, bourbon Pursuit. It's it's the home <laughs> of Lost Connections as well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Bourbon was, I wish I could. Yeah. If we knew what we know now then, my God. <laughs> yeah. That was, um, that was when, when, when um, I was just starting to call out Templeton for like, you know, not not uh, putting state of distillation and stuff on there, and like trying to say it was theirs. And so you kind of come in the scene as like you know you're trying to you're getting into it, you're you're wanting to to do it, and and you start you start a moonshine. Let's talk about ice balls versus ice cubes. It's all about physics, and volume, and surface area. Did you know that an ice ball has 24% less surface area compared to the same volume of ice in a cube form? Well, less surface area exposed to warm liquid means a slower ice melt and less drink dilution without sacrificing any chilling power. And the coolest way to make ice balls is with a meltdown ice ball press. First, you take some ice in the provided silicone cups, you place this ice into meltdown and watch as the conduction from copper or aluminum melts the ice right in front of you you can literally see the melted water cascade down the sides. And in a minute, you've got a perfect ice ball to put in your drink. Meltdown, it's the perfect solution to dilution pollution. You can use promo code PURSUIT to receive $100 off. So check it out now at meltdownice.com. Age Denor is a small brand 
founded by two bourbon-loving brother-in-laws who design innovative products for whiskey lovers, and their products have been featured by the likes of Food & Wine and GQ Magazine. The Travel Decanter is the best way to travel and bring your favorite spirits wherever you go. Visit agedandor.com to see their entire collection of products and stay up to date on upcoming launches this bourbon season. Are you a private barrel club looking for total control over your own label? Or perhaps a retailer wanting low minimums on a private label bourbon that sells? Or maybe you're just a business, an organization, or charity, and you're looking to make a statement with your own gift of a barrel pick. Indiana's own Krogman's makes it super easy. Make the pilgrimage to Bloomington, Indiana, where tucked away in the old Otis Elevator Factory, you can select your own barrel or barrels and discuss every detail of your bottle, from the label, the cap, and the closure, and create something truly unique. So stop putting stickers on picks and take your club to the next level. Go to krogmans.com. That's K-R-O-G-M-A-N-S dot com to learn more. So you kind of come in the scene as like, you know, you're trying to, you're getting into it, you're you're wanting to to do it, and, and you start, you start a moonshine, you start a moonshine. So take us through that process of like right. what it was like, you know, that early, that early stage and, and the, and the rationale behind uh, a moonshine, which moonshine was really hot back then. That it was a, a it was having its moment, honestly. And, uh, and, you know, people, I don't think people realize how difficult it was back then to be even started distillery because mm-hmm. there, there weren't a lot of still manufacturers, mm-hmm. uh, stock bottles. There were like three or four, <laughs> you know, the, the, it's just, uh, it, uh, it changed so much in a, in a very short time. And then the, all the laws were very unforgiving for someone like you. Right. Absolutely. And tough. And, um, yeah, I mean, they, it just was not making it easy for smaller distilleries but anyway so we started and uh of course we needed uh cash and so the the easiest way to make cash i I used to tell people um you know new distilleries make if you're in kentucky make uh moonshine and if you're you know somewhere else you may make gin it's kind of funny that we have gin here now (laughs) that's a whole nother story (laughs) full full circle right gotta gotta pivot (laughs) but uh yeah, so we started with the the moonshine, and I uh, and I really wanted to do it right, and we we stayed in a traditional moonshine recipes and fermented it in in oak barrels, and and really just tried to stay as true to uh, our heritage and the heritage of of distilling as possible. I didn't use any uh, GNS or anything like that, which was very popular at that time. Grain neutral spirit, by the way, people would what they would do is they would. Someone would buy grain neutral spirit, spirit from Cargill or MGP, and then uh, s- cut it, slap it a, uh, a, a phony backstory about their grandpappy being a moonshiner, and say, "Whoa, we got the same recipe on over here." <laughs> How weird! <laughs> uh, yeah, it's so, Paris business. Yeah, good God. So, so anyway, so we stayed true, and 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 moonshine was having a moment, and we we did very well with it. Actually, it's not as uh, so. I bought, allow- I bought a bottle. Yeah, so, you see, it, it worked, go. and uh, and it allowed us to you know put back a little bit of bourbon, which is always what we had wanted to do. So we continued to do that, and we had you know we did have our day with moonshine. You know, we went everything from sugar shine to all the way to the licensing deal with the moon pie, and did moon pie moonshine. So that was uh, yeah, I remember that. Yeah. By the mm-hmm. way, I could go for a moon pie yeah, right like, now. Mm-hmm. It was actually it, it was pretty tasty. Yeah. <laughs> sweet but tasty. i remember not <laughs> hating your stuff you know yeah. i remember the, the moonshine stuff i, mean, I hated most of the moonshine. i had one of the moonshines that i swear if i drank the whole thing i'd have gone blind but yeah. there was some bad stuff coming out but it's amazing to see like the growth and everything um over over the last decade of what you've done and to include becoming you know one of the hot places to go on the on the bourbon trail so you had talked about like putting bourbon a little bourbon back. What was that like um, at that at that phase? How many barrels were you putting back? Were you kind of hoping they'd age faster? You know. Well, you know, the it's interesting because we didn't do uh, any small barrels at that time. Only fifty threes, and uh, so you know it, it's going to be at least four years. I mm-hmm. didn't want to do anything less than that. We just did maybe one a, one a month. 
one barrel a month yeah at the, wow. in the beginning so you know it's just not that much well i mean i do remember going through there six years ago maybe even more than that now and because we had we had done a distillery tour at makers and then went there and i mean it's it was like night and day right right because i remember watching the still and like just seeing it drip off like it <laughs> literally was just like a drip it, it wasn't like a it wasn't like a like a garden hose of distillate coming out it was it was like a drip it was like a small it was like if, if you if you cracked open the faucet just enough you know mm -hmm. you don't want your pipes to freeze in the winter <laughs> it was like just, that was i remember that was like the amount that was coming yeah, out but, limestone branch one drip at a time <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and then in um so we've always done that but just a little bit at a time and then in 2015 uh i was had always been interested in in uh getting one of the brands that were mm -hmm. uh, originally with the family. And uh, so Yellowstone was one that I pursued. And so I uh, wrote uh, Luxco, who was the, the owner at the time. And uh, it's kind of funny. We did this. Uh, <laughs> hey, Don, I got an idea for you. <laughs> well, it's kind of funny. We did this uh, six month email thing, like for two years, like I'd email him, then six months later, he'd yell me, email me back. And then, you know, then I'd e wait. And then about six months later, I'd email him. So we went on through this courtship for, you know, a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and then they uh, then they came over and, and saw that we were serious. I think, think that they didn't know that how serious we were, but saw that we were serious and uh, produce a good quality product and things. So um, they partnered with us. And of course, they owned Yellowstone. So that brought Yellowstone into the limestone branch uh, family. And that's when I became responsible for what's in the bottle. Yeah. And I think that this is where, this is where people start to get to know you, right? You know, they didn't see like that, those early, you know, sacrifices. They didn't see you uh, opening up a hole on Moonshiner's TV and letting someone go down there to, <laughs> you know, unclog a pipe. <laughs> <laughs> keep going yeah i'm yeah. interested <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> there, there's a I, you know what i don't want to get you all <laughs> off on that tangent but um sorry everybody you're getting some inside funnies between steven and i yeah you, you'll have to go back and and check out moonshiners go watch. evidently fred's on there and i am too so, yeah, so we, we there's some there's some funny stories i there. feel bad i'm the only person not on it now it's like soon. it's like i'm not in the club soon uh but anyway you, you know no people didn't see those sacrifices and i know you would have loved to have been able to do this all on your own, but was it w was it difficult? Because you 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 brought in a partner. Partners don't just say, "Oh, here's some money." Let's <laughs> right. let's you know they they want a piece. You know, right. was was it difficult for you to kind of um, give up some of that control? Yes, you know, I mean, it wasn't okay. Let's put it in theory. It was not, and they 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 allow us a wide uh parameter of creativity and things but you know it's still when you go and you're it's like i i was used to just making a decision and doing it or not doing it so it took a while to get over that sure <laughs> we can do that and then yeah oh yeah i have to talk gotta, to somebody gotta else <laughs> run it by my other wife yeah so but they, they've been very good to us and uh and we've you know we're and when you say they, you're talking Luxco. Our partner, Luxco, yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, they've been great partners, and we're at a uh, a place where we would not be probably in, uh, you know, Paul my, is a little bit older, or is just a few years older than me, and uh, in our lifetime, you know, we would not probably be where we are now had we not partnered with them. So it's been great. Has it been instrumental in either finding the liquid that goes in there, distribution, like kind of talk about absolutely so the the distilling part and everything at the distillery is run by uh myself and our crews over there and then all the things that i used to hate anyway which was dealing with the, the distributors and and getting it out there uh that's what they take care of so we were it, it worked out really well that way and then also they've had relationships with uh various distilleries here in Kentucky since the 1950s. So they had a vast stock of bourbon that we were able to draw from. So that was, you know, instrumental in making the brand actually. Yeah, absolutely. And kind of talk about, you know, how the operations have changed a little bit, you know, at Limestone Branch, you know, doing a barrel a day, 
now having you know something like Yellowstone in the portfolio. And I'm, I'm not too sure I know much about this uh, this this bourbon we have or this whiskey. Minor have in the case, yeah. So kind of talk about that as well, and and sort of how is limestone starting to scale or starting to do things a little bit differently? Right. So we are, uh, you know, we started out like I said, maybe a barrel every month, and we went to a, a barrel every day. Now we're at uh, a couple of barrels a day, uh, and then we're looking at maybe we're, we're definitely going to increase the production from there as well soon. So as soon as I have it nailed down we'll we'll talk a little bit more about that <laughs> as soon as that investor money starts rolling <laughs> back in something like that yeah, yeah. so I, I you know the story behind minor case like folks this is uh this is a forgotten name in and whiskey and i was so friggin happy that you created this brand uh tell everybody about M minor case and you know the story yeah so that so you're right and uh minor cases the brand is really dear to our heart because my brother and i because that's that's our first brand that we really uh, got behind with uh, a brown liquid and uh minor case was uh jacob beams who was jacob if people don't realize was the original beam who came to kentucky in 1792 and sold his mm -hmm. first whiskey in 1795 so jacob uh minor is jacob's great grandson and then I am Minor Case's great grandson, and uh, Minor was the uh, family ties. They just keep going, don't <laughs> right? they? Yeah. And so Minor was the oldest of that generation, which included Jim Beam was his first cousin, and uh, well respected. Uh, he he learned his trade at early times, which was owned by at that time by his uncle Jack Beam. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that early times goes back to the Beams as well. Yeah, so, and that's where he started. They usually started around 14 years old, and then at 28, he bought into a distillery in Gethsemane, Kentucky, and uh, it became the uh, Head and Beam, Beam and Head Distillery. I think that's Head and Beam. Anyway, <laughs> the two, two, uh, there's, there's two a lot of, there's a lot of beams. We're, we're finding this out. <laughs> two, yes. two families, and, uh, and then he eventually bought that distillery out, and it became MC Beam and Company. And uh, do you know what his brand was? Uh, the, the, it's a little it, controversial at this time. Um, the star was it? What, what? What? I don't know what it was. No, no, the, the, the star the, bell or uh, no? Uh, five star was one of JW Dance, but yeah. Uh, uh, minor case brand back in the the turn of the century, late eighteen hundreds, early nineteen hundreds was old Trump. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that. Yeah, if no, there's no. A, if there's a time to revive it. I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, old Donald Trump just took claim to that. You yeah, know? He, he's heard that, and he's he's getting the getting the old lawsuit out ready for you. Yeah. So uh, you know, Jim Beam was making old tub, and and Minor Case was making old Trump yeah. at that time. Interesting. And, yeah, it's kind of funny when we went in first went into business. I, this was you know well before the presidency and everything, but I, I had thought about it, and then it's like, well. He, he owns the, because of the vodka, he owns the alcohol space of, of Trump. And it's just like, I didn't want to have to, I didn't want that partner for sure. <laughs> <laughs> that, well, that, and he's got lawyers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but minor case, you know, um, minor case was, you know, I knew him from um, early times and, you know, there's like uh, journal entries of him being just an uh, incredible accomplished uh, person and distiller so um i i like those i like um i like it when bottles tell real history right you know and and, and somebody who had been forgotten yeah you know especially in the you know in the beams uh you know he was he, he started the beam family reunions you know back in the day uh so then they've been going on oh those are legendary yeah so uh this one's kid rock shows up to i mean <laughs> beam i mean there's a solo cups paper plates and um yeah oh, it's something well, something always happens it, it's a great it's a great thing but it it's and they've been going on forever but you know he, he was the patriarch of that generation and well thought of and you know people would come to him for advice and things and but he died shortly after prohibition ended so that he was never able to get back into the business why do you think that the bourbon industry has a habit of forgetting you know people like minor case or jacob spears or daniel shawhan uh or wadi boone or whatever why why is it like it's is it because the marketers are just going with what's hot and the 
I, mean, I, I think that's it. And then, uh, and then through consolidation, you know, people buy distilleries, they take a, a brand or two and then they run with that. Mm -hmm. You know, people ask me, you know, why, uh, you know, what happened, what happened to the Dant brand or what happened to this brand? It says, it says you know, it really depends on who bought the brand and how successful then that company was, mm -hmm. you know, because it, it just depends on, you know, outside forces that have nothing really to do with the, the actual brand. And, and it's in like historians like myself and Mike Veach, Chuck Cowdery. I mean, we try to tell those stories. We try to put them out there, you know, but it is, it only, it only resonates if there's a brand connected to it, you know, right. and, and it's, it's kind of sad. Well, I think yeah. we're in a little bit of a different time as well when, I mean, if you look back at the, you know, I'm sure you have so many old labels that you know about that aren't in existence anymore and you could revive them if you wanted to. And and, you know, today you see, as, as Stephen had said, a consolidation of things. People put their money on, you know, a lot of money on one horse to win versus, you know, mm. really trying to play the field. Right. And so it could be, you know, a difference in the way that we, we work now as an economy in regards of uh, distribution, fighting for shelf space, all those different things where you, you, you can't sit there and say like, okay, let's revive everything that we knew we mm. used to have. Um, so. And, and, you know, I don't, th the, the marketers don't have that, you know, personal connection to a, yeah. a, a, a brand, you know, the, the minor case is, it's very dear to my heart, you know, because that's my, you know, great grandfather. And so, and I think it, yeah, I, I was like, I like what Campari's doing, you know, with their bringing back their, their heritage bottles. I don't actually know what they're calling it, like WB, WB Saffle. Saffle and, yeah. yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, WB Saffle. He was, Sapple was a, was a big name, but he had all daughters and right. like, you know, and he kind of gets kind of pushed off to the, to the side and everything. But I mean, in Anderson County, like his whiskey was the shit and right. ev everybody sought that out. Yeah. And so for them to have that kind of, uh, that vision to, to bring back some, some history to, to that, you know, it, it's, to me, it's very, it's great. I love seeing it. Right. And it also... And I say that, you know, he had all daughters. And it also, when you dig down these, uh, when you pull on these strings a little bit, you kind of see like, oh, yeah, they they didn't really allow women to to do much back then. Right. It's like, that sucked. Although, you know, I hear that Joe Beam's wife, Joel Beam, who was Minor Case's younger brother, who really, he and his sons pretty much revived the the bourbon industry in kentucky after uh, that's, prohibition yeah that's correct uh yeah she was um actually bill samuels when i was writing my book whiskey women bill samuels like was like she, like she was the savior of uh of a of beam yeah. in a big way yes. but uh i mean women women have obviously always played a role it's just they it's only now that we're starting to recognize them right that, that is a shame but it's i'm glad it's happening yeah. But to kind of also talk about what you were thinking about with the labels and having a connection, I think that's a big difference in what we see with Campari and WB Saffle is that that is more of a, that's more of a marketing play. Like what Steven brings, this is, this is his family lineage. This is his history. Oh yeah. Which man. is, which is a lot different than somebody that just says like, oh, I'm going to start a bourbon company. Let me go and see what defunct labels were used to be. And mm -hmm. I can just go ahead and, which A, by the way, anybody that makes their own, it makes it a hell of a lot easier to do that because you already have the artwork made. You don't have to start from the very beginning. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it, there is there is definitely something to be said about you know Stephen about what you're doing and and having this connection to it and knowing that yeah this is my this is my lineage like this is what I want to continue to build and have something live on for for more generations to come and not let it be another sacrifice of you know consolidation. Right. But it's, mm -hmm. he's also a story of like this in in a lot of ways it. It's a sad story to me because you wanted to start in the 1970s. Right. And you didn't have an outlet. You didn't have an opportunity. So imagine like if he was able to like jump into the game into this in the 70s, what would it what would it be like now? Well, you know, you know? what <laughs> another probably, probably very, very, very touchy. <laughs> 70s were never a good time, right? So for, <laughs> at least for, for brown spirits. Yeah. But no. the, 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 when I um Jim Beam had their 200th anniversary. And I, I attended that. They had a big party out at, at Jim Beam. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was talking to a gentleman, and he was from the Liquor Control Board in New Hampshire. You know, I was a novice, didn't know much about distribution, didn't know anything much about the, the business at all. But we, we struck up a conversation, and, you know, he, he found out, but he knew J.W. Dant, the brand. 
And uh, when I talked about him, I said, well, you know, we have the old recipes and, you know, it talks about a bucket of this and a bucket of that. And he said, well, you need to start a distillery and make things a bucket at a time. And that stuck in my head. And that really probably one of the reasons why Limestone Branch started as, as it did. But, but that, that again, you, you talk about what united, what ignited my uh, desire for the distilleries is that he, he was pushing at that time, but there weren't any small distilleries at that time. If there were, there were. Uh, MB Roland was basically it, yeah. you know, in Kentucky. Yeah, uh, I don't even was, think they were there yet. They're two, yeah, they started in 2009. So yeah. It'd been, so, and this was well before that. I don't yeah. know when the 200th anniversary was of Jim Beam, but anyway, uh, 2005, probably. Something like that. Don't look at me. I'm not a historian. <laughs> yeah. I, I come here and ask the questions. All right. So. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, so that that really kind of reignited my desire to to, to look into it again. So that that's when I uh, started looking, and it was always important for me. You talk about the 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 brands and things. It was always important for me to learn how to be a distiller. And really, the brand was kind of a second thought. It was more about me learning what my family did. Mm -hmm. And that's why when we opened the distillery, we opened with a very tactile still because I wanted to learn, you know, the basics and uh, uh, not just put something into a computer program. I actually wanted to be a distiller. I didn't want to just have a, a brand. It would have probably made more financial sense to have a brand than a distillery, but you know. Listen, we don't we don't get in this game for financial reasons, right? Passion, right? right. So you said something. Uh, it reminded me of a conversation we were having before we went on the air. And your business card says distiller, and you pointed out he's like he like not master distiller. So let's uh, give tell us why uh, you know anybody right now in the world can call themselves a master distiller. And you arguably could. So right. why don't you call yourself a master distiller? Well, um, uh, for, uh, out of respect for minor case. Probably because you and, catch a lot of shit at the family <laughs> reunion. <maybe. yeah. laughs> <laughs> but, you know, out of respect for uh, minor case who spent his life, you know, in the, in the business and Guy Beam, my grandfather, mm -hmm. who was in it his entire life. Uh, these were, you know, the true masters. And I feel like, I think I'm above an apprentice now, but uh, you know we're getting there. Do you do you take issues with with like some of these smaller distillers who start up and five days later they're a master distiller? Uh, you know, people people do silly things. So <laughs> <laughs> I can call myself a mechanic, but it doesn't mean I'm going to start working on Audis tomorrow. Yeah, so. right. <laughs> yeah. I changed oil once in my life. <laughs> No, and, and you know, before we we kind of like move off here because I, you know, we're reaching the top. I want to I want to kind of talk about, um, you know, the brands that you do have here because talk about what you are doing that actually goes into Yellowstone and how you are, uh, you know, either you know blending, taking product, and everything like right. that. Yeah. So, uh, you know, we're we're not expanding the product line per se so much so we yellowstone is our bourbon minor cases are a rye whiskey and then we just added the gin but uh so yellow what, what's the gin called makes people know it's a uh, bowling and birch all right which is uh actually the other so we have all tell me this is another label that you found and you're like no oh. it's it's uh but it is my uh, grandmother's so they included their names as well so fantastic the, the, uh bowling and birch names um so anyway the but yellowstone we this is our flagship uh the yellowstone select which is in every state and uh, many different countries as well and so that is actually placed a, in the top five i think in my four number four. it was number four it was number four in my recent taste off it's yeah. it's fantastic I mean, it it's, really is it's just yeah. a it's just a great everyday sort of sipper yeah I, I say it's you know it's a it's a very classic kentucky bourbon profile classic is a good yeah. word and uh so but that's a blend of ours and then the source barrels that we pick from our partners. So it does have a little bit of pot still, and then it has some of the calm still as well. Oh my goodness! You're doing a rum tech, a rum blending technique there. That's <laughs> we're awesome. We're just yeah. taking what you got and just yeah. dealing with it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's usually yeah, yeah. It's yeah. Over there. <laughs> yeah, glad you said. I'm gonna write that one down the next time. <laughs> Hey, Steve, we got a new marketing yeah. angle. <laughs> We're doing it like the rough winters. No, but, but, you know, everything that, that Limestone Branch does on site is uh, pot still, 
you know, and then the barrels that Luxico has is uh, column still. So we know it's a, that's a blend. So it is a kind of unique, unique product that way. Um, now, technically, this is not a, w what we would call a blend of straights, right? This is a this is a mingling because it's still under your, or do you have to label it as a blend? It would be a blend no, of straights. It, no, it's it's, it's a, just bourbon. Yeah, it's just bourbon because it's yeah. four, all four year old. So. Yeah, and and it's not you know it's still one distillery, same distilling company. So right. like Woodford Reserve, which is batching its uh, Louisville Distillery and Woodford County Distillery, same thing. Right. So then we do uh, a limited edition each year, which is something that, you know, I'll, I'll just do uh, either fi a finished product or if we have a, a, a batch of barrels that I think are really nice by themselves, like last year was just a nine-year-old, uh, which was all source at that time because we didn't have any nine-year-old. But, um, and then this year it's in Armagnac, finished in Armagnac cast. Mm. It's very nice. I dropped my bottle. <laughs> did you see, did, did you see, did I tell you about this? Uh-uh. So we are having a 4th of July get together, you know, Steven gave me a bottle and I'm coming over, you know, to, to pour it for someone. My kid bumps me or something happens and the thing drops and it splatters all over the concrete. By the way, your bottles are not concrete proof. <laughs> Don't know like you know. just need to get a new kid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it shattered. We played, um, we, we played taps and everything for it because it was, it, Sad moment in my yeah. life. We'll we'll get you another bottle for Thank sure. You, <laughs> <laughs> so as we but, kind of wrap this up, I, I'd be remiss not to at least mention, you know, what has been, uh, you know, relationship talking to anything like that with, uh, say, Fred, you know, Fred No, and, and that sort of like that beam legacy over there. Like, have you had any kind of interactions with them? Uh, you know, they were when we first started, we didn't know how how that would enter what would mm -hmm. happen but uh they were always very supportive they're the ones who uh sponsored us into the kentucky bourbon kda uh, the kentucky distillers association so they uh sponsored our distillery because uh, the stories have to have be a sponsor have a sponsor to get into the organization so we've had we have a, gr a good relationship and uh and then i also just want to shout out with the you know we talk about the dance and Wally Dan is now reviving the old uh, Dan Distillery at yeah, uh, in Gethsemane, that, yeah. and it's going to be a, a, a great thing too. And it's just nice to have the dance back because it was really sad for me. And I always played, made sure that we highlighted JW Dance story in mm -hmm. our story because I didn't want it to be forgotten. It's just be thankful thing. you don't have to write the check to get that thing fixed. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of money in bourbon, oh and it's not even in the bourbon part. Yeah, <laughs> no, it's not. No, mm. a lot of a lot of defunct places but you know steve i want to say thank you again for coming on you know sharing your story and your whiskey with us it was fantastic i didn't even tell people that we were actually i was drinking uh yellowstone as well as uh the, the rye whiskey here and you know, they're both fantastic so cheers uh, cheers yeah, to you yeah, and, uh, you did a fantastic job so yeah uh, uh, but before we kind of sound off you know how can people learn more about uh you know limestone branch yellowstone everything like that how can they follow it or can yeah. they can they meet you on site over at Limestone yeah. Branch? Yeah, usually if I'm not traveling, I'm I'm at the distillery and uh, which is in Lebanon, Kentucky. And there's a you know limestonebranch.com is our uh, website, and then uh, at Limestone Branch is for Facebook and Twitter, mm -hmm. all the social, all the social stuff. Yeah, yeah. So um, it's all also if if you Google Yellowstone or Limestone Branch, it. it Hopefully it's the number one. Everything pops up. Yeah. Yeah. You gotta, you gotta fight the Google SEO and take down that 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 national park. You know, like bring <laughs> bring bourbon to the top. Well, you know, who knows? I, they may by the time this comes out, they may not even have SEO funding over there at Yellowstone anymore. <laughs> but let's 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 hope for the best. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Like Fred, why are you always kill the party? <laughs> yeah, you know, that's something I I which I forgot to mention, and that we do donate money back to the parks. National Parks oh, Conservation yeah. Association through the uh, uh, so that the parks benefit from the sale of Yellowstone, and we've donated well over a hundred thousand dollars in the last couple of years. So, That's so fantastic. in addition to helping the children of Kentucky by paying his property taxes, mm -hmm. which goes to the schools and the roads in, in his respective county, um, he's also helping our, our public parks, our environment. Our trees, our oxygen. Yeah, I mean, literally oxygen. everything. <laughs> yeah. So when you're He's buying Yellowstone, you're saving the climate and the children. <laughs>
<laughs> there you go. And you're helping us breathe all at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Literally, it's a lifesaver. <laughs> hey, not all heroes wear capes, folks. His name is Stephen Beam. <laughs> well, again, Stephen, thank you so much for coming on. Make sure you follow them on all the socials. Follow us as well, as well as Fred Minnick and his YouTube channels where you get to see everything that he had talked about, you know, with his recent taste offs and everything like that. So make sure you go and you check that out. And if you like what you hear, leave us a comment, whether you're watching this or listening to this, a review would be awesome. And if you do want to help support the show, patreon.com slash bourbon pursuit. Mm -hmm. With that, Fred, thank you so much for joining us Always. today. Steven, thank uh, you again. It's been great being here. Thanks. Yes. Appreciate it. Cheers, everybody. We'll see you all next week. Cheers. Be safe. <laughs>